Welcome back to the Mail In Podcast. Lovely uh, Wednesday morning here in Austin, Texas. If you're listening to this, it's Thursday morning. Or at some point during the uh, during the weekend. I'm your host, Brad Merriman. To my right, the lovely, the denimed out, Sally DeFries. It's just a denim shirt. It's a chambray shirt. I like, I like shirt. it. A chambray denim? Yeah. What's going on? Just... Just getting well ready to go to the Derby. Oh, I cannot wait to go to the Derby with your husband. The issue about Will going on a trip, like, no offense, he definitely can do stuff by himself, but mm-hmm. he, like, puts stuff on me that normally, like, when we're going on a trip together, I handle all of that. So he's he's still taking advantage of the, uh, the, the trip planner that you are. Right. And the executioner, not to sound grave there but you are you are a, a, a expert at getting things done right so He's, next week when we go to new york i mm-hmm. will handle all of those things right but you also get to attend that trip this right. one this week a little different i like feel like i still i mean i had to drop off his dry cleaning this morning which mm. in retrospect might have kind of been my fault to give him some credit i'm gonna sneeze <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so he's trying to wear this white linen shirt mm. on Derby Day okay. under his linen suit. It's and gonna be I, a good look. I was like, you don't need to dry clean that. We can wash it. We'll hang dry it. Mm. Whatever. Because I do that with my linen shirts. Sure. Like I wash it on cold, hang dry. Mm-hmm. He claims I shrunk it. It's really just wrinkled. Uh, it's very wrinkled. Okay. So I was gonna iron it to like show him like no, it's you're good. fine. Yeah. He's like, you need to get it dry clean so that it's like really pressed, <laughs> oh, so God. that I know that it's fine. So I had to go find the same day dry cleaner today, so that he could decide whether the shirt's gonna be okay. Oh, uh, I see. Or whether I shrunk it, in which case I will inherit the shirt. Right. It will become your linen shirt. It will become my linen shirt. But he doesn't realize it's just wrinkled and it looks shorter than it actually is. Mm. You know? I I get it. I get it. Well, I'm glad uh I'm glad you're able to find a place. Yeah. And Will will survive uh without we'll, a, d- a day of his linen shirt. We'll I, see if it's shrinks. I hope. I, don't know. I hope it's not shrunk because it was kind of an expensive shirt and I hope mm. I didn't mess it up. <laughs> uh I'm in a similar situation where I, I need shoes. I've had the same Bunch of suits, bunch of undershirts, this, that, the other thing. I've just worn the same shoes. Like what kind of shoes? Like dress shoes. What do you think about Sabas? Uh, I'd be down with, for that, but I ha- and I have some. I have like espadrilles as well, but I think I'm gonna go. I with a derby situation. I think I'm just gonna go like a classic chocolate brown. Okay. Like that matches the horse. Like that's. If there's one time to be sort of classic, it's the Derby. And I have my suit. I have everything ready to go. My pants that Emily saw. Emily Emily Young got the, uh, oh, the sneak preview of. With no bolo, by the way. The joggers. The joggers. and Why would shoes. she lie and say that you were wearing a bolo? I have though? no idea. It's it's a very oddly peculiar thing to Because if say. you're going to wear a bolo, then you kind of have license to also wear cowboy boots. But not if you're wearing no. joggers. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. You know, no. I'm wearing a I'm wearing a bolo on Derby Day though. Right. But I'm saying if you were wearing a bolo, you could just forego the loafers and wear cowboy boots. Totally. But you can't because you're wearing jogger pants. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would never do that. You can't wear joggers and cowboy boots. I'm sure I mean, it's been done. You could I will tuck not them in and look like a real no. tool. You would you would look horrendous. Yeah. But that being said, I am having a very hard time finding Shoes. Go to Nordstrom. I did. Selection's terrible at the domain one. I might have to. I'm, I haven't tried the Barton Creek one yet, which I've heard is a much larger selection. The the shoes are better at the Barton Creek one. I'm gonna try that then. Yeah. So that's my that's my today situation. I'm gonna do some research. I went in blind, just hoping. You know, I went to Nordstrom. I went to Neiman. I went to Macy's. I went to Aldo. I went to Ted Baker to see what they had. I got shut out. Although, like, could you like I, overnight some Zappos? I could have got something at Neiman, but it was like I didn't want to spend five hundred bucks on shoes. So get on Zappos. I might. I might. They I, like literally Amazon will, too. They will like free overnight ship you some shit. 
bottom line, I have some research to do. And I also don't know exactly what I want, which is proving to be an issue. I just want something to speak to me as far as shoes go. Yeah. I know I want brown. Stressful. Like a chocolate brown. And I know I want loafer over like tie up. Yeah. But that's where that's where my my inclination stops. So I don't know. I'm on brick watch. I um no offense. I think you were on brick watch before that. What? Why? <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> I just so think if mean. you're wearing the outfit you were wearing at Ranch 616 when Emily saw you definitely wearing a bolo tie, she texted us not even knowing about Brick Watch and was like, what the fuck was Brett wearing? So, That's crazy. It's a very normal outfit. I was wearing a white button down and pants. <laughs> Randy's making some faces like he might agree with me. That's crazy. Absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Now I'm rattled. <laughs> now you're rattled. Yeah. Emily I <laughs> I just don't understand why she would make up that you were wearing a bolo tie. I went right from Ranch 616 to Carve, where I was with your husband. She literally texted and said he was wearing a bolo tie. I'll find – I'm going to pull up the receipts. Insane. Maybe I said I was wearing a bolo tie to the Derby or something like that, but I don't know. No. I, no. I – No. That's not what she literally said specifically. He was wearing a bolo tie. It's that okay. This is it's just an insane accusation, which I I'm no stranger to a bolo tie. I'm just saying I was not wearing a bolo tie. Okay, we we should probably argue about this some other time. Yeah, we should. We're the mail in podcast. We answer your questions, give you something useful to walk away with. Please help us out by telling a friend about the show, sending a, a clip or two around, subscribing on iTunes, following on Spotify. Hit the hotline number to uh, leave a voicemail, 888-362-6245. Or you can write in at the link in the Twitter bio at Mail In Podcast. Sally, do you want to hop right in? Yeah, you want me to go first? You want to go first? Uh, I'll go first. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, should I tell my wife she needs to lose weight? A little background here. My wife and I have been together since college. Back then, we were both in good shape and active. Fast forward 10 years and two kids later, and we both have let ourselves go a bit. For reference, we both got to the point of doctors telling us to lose weight and uh, being within the, quote, obese category of BMI. Uh, last fall, we made the decision to get some workout equipment, such as a Peloton and a squat rack, and get back into shape for our health and to set an example for our kids. I've stuck to it and lost 50 pounds and getting within a few months of being back at my college fitness level. My wife quit after three weeks. At this point, it feels like she's starting to be spiteful towards me for the progress I've made. Should I bring up the subject of her working out again? Or should I continue to get in better shape and hope she eventually decides to push herself again? Delicate. So okay. Uh, first of all, um, if you can't tell your wife of 10 years, the truth. Who are you going to tell? Who's going to tell her? Yeah. I I think this is a sensitive subject for people because no one really likes to be told that they uh, need to lose weight or need to change something about their appearance. Mm -hmm. I would personally come at it from a health perspective. That's where my mind initially went as well. Because it's not like... It's not like, oh, she wants to lose 20 pounds. She's not self-confident, but then she doesn't do anything about it and she eats burgers or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Uh, we've also probably answered that question that I that Will probably wrote about me. <laughs> like <laughs> I I think every every human goes through that mm -hmm. where you're like, you just want to lose the vanity weight. Yeah. But like you also that like the effort for that is like really high for like kind of a low return of like maybe 10 pounds Yeah. versus when you're in the obese category. So obese BMI is over 30. Yeah. That, which I, I remember doing this stuff in like health class. If you're a BMI of 30, you don't look like crazy big, right? It's kind of, it's like, a, Ooh, that's like, well, or maybe overweight is lower than expected, I guess. It's, it's kind of a twofold situation. Uh, Number one, our country accepts that now. Yes. When we probably shouldn't. Agreed. Like, And number two, it also depends on how you carry your weight. Mm -hmm. So some people who um, are BMI of 30 but are taller and they carry it like in their hips and they're pear-shaped, 
tends to be healthier than if you're like shorter, squatty, or apple shaped. Sure. Speaking about this from just like a clinical perspective. Right. Um, but 30, no one's, I mean, probably you're going to go to the doctor. They're going to be like, you're being nice 30. You're getting up there, but they're not going to be like. Re like, hey, radically change this right. or else. It's like, hey, probably should think about this. That's a whole different podcast for a different time. Mm -hmm. Should we probably be being a little bit more aggressive about it? Yeah, probably for health. But this is my argument for that. If if Will and I were in that position, I think it would be a, hey, we've got two kids. Um, we want you around. I, I don't want to lose you. Yeah. And I... Being at a higher BMI puts you at risk for a bunch of things, mm -hmm. high blood pressure, uh, sleep apnea, heart disease, all of those things that can feel like that are really insidious and probably develop before you even realize it. And then you get diagnosed mm -hmm. that at like 48 and you're like, well, shit. Yeah. So if you're younger, like saying these people are like mid thirties or something, they've been married for 10 years. That is the route I take. Mm -hmm. I think when approaching your spouse of like, hey, I know that we talked about like losing weight. I've been on that road. You seem to have stalled. I want like I I know you would you'd look beautiful and happy at any weight, but I want you to be healthy mm -hmm. for your future for yeah. like be around for me, be around for the kids. Yeah. Is there any angle you take with like attraction here? Uh, no. I don't think you do either. Because I I worry, it, because, even even if that were true, yeah. even if he was like I'm not physically attracted to her anymore mm -hmm. because she, she's changed, yeah, physically. I I think saying that to a person never leaves their psyche. That's fair. So you really run the risk of like totally fucking them up. Right. Either to the point where like they totally give up or they go like so full throttle that it like never leaves them and then they like develop an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. The the other thing about this is that men and women, this is like very also typical men and women who try to lose weight together, it's easier for men to lose weight than it is totally. for women, especially yeah. after a certain age, especially if you, after you've had kids, if she's perimenopausal, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different factors. So when you pr approach it by a health perspective, be like, hey, why don't you, you know, give it the college try for a month? And if nothing's budging in the same way that like probably pounds are melting off this guy, go to your doctor and be like, yeah. should we get your thyroid checked? Do we need to get this checked? Like there's a bunch of different syndromes that women can have that men can't have, like polycystic ovarian syndrome that cause women to hold on to weight not have hunger, satiety, all of these things that are now fixable mm -hmm. or treatable with certain medications to not be named that are treating diabetes, but also treating other things. Um, and I'm not saying anybody should get on any of those. I'm What I'm saying is when women, especially past childbearing age, have trouble losing weight, and that's as, that's assuming like you're eating healthy, you are working yeah, out. And like, and I'm talking about an 80-20 rule here. Yeah. I mean, like, you're doing it five days a week and you're mm -hmm. not seeing any change, but yet your husband has dropped 50 pounds. That's really discouraging. But also, like, you could go to a doctor and be like, can you run a gamut of labs on me? There might be some hormone that's off. And men, unfortunately, usually don't have to deal with that in the mm -hmm. same way that women do. Sure. Um, most of my friends who've like had that issue. It's like their thyroid has been like totally off the charts one way or the other. Okay. So it's, it's good. If you're going to approach it from a health perspective, I think try to be supportive, try to do it together, get the whole family involved. Everyone be eating good meals, et cetera. And don't like totally, you know, drag her down if she wants to have a cheat meal or whatever. But mm -hmm. Unfortunately, dieting and exercise and things like that, especially for weight loss, it's totally person dependent. So whatever is working for this guy is probably not going to work for his wife. Yeah, and I, I totally get that. Totally agree. I was gonna that that was gonna be my angle here. If you, if the working out thing is just proving to be difficult to stick to, then let's let's try the diet piece of it. 
Yeah. And I know it's like two kids is tough to have like the cleanest diet in the world. You're going to have chicken nuggets in the house. You're going to have, you name it. Right. But maybe that like, that's a material change that you can sort of consciously make and see and see if there's results. Because once you get like, anytime anybody loses weight, I've tried to lose 10 pounds before. And it's like, when you see the first two or three, it motivates you to, right. to do the, like, it's like, oh, a result. Now I'm going to keep going. And so maybe that can help unlock it. So then all of a sudden, oh, hey, that squat rack doesn't look so bad. And The other thing too, I think, and this is very specific to parents and, you know, kind of old school gender roles, but she made it feel, and I know I feel this way as a mom, is like, when do I have the time? Sure. I'm working yeah. full time. Like I, I come home at five. I immediately take over Fritz. I mean, with Will's help, but we're making dinner, mm-hmm. we're doing all this stuff. Yeah. And then I'm exhausted. And by the time they get he gets to bed, I'm like, I, I want, eat yeah. dinner and I want to pass out. Mm-hmm. So if that's another thing, if you're like, she's not having the time, be like, hey, I'm gonna offer to take the kids off the hand off your hands so you can have an hour of free time. Or we're gonna get you know, a babysitter to come over on like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so you can go work out yeah, or whatever, like make sure you're giving her the opportunity to actually take the time yeah. because she might be so busy. Like she's probably getting the kids ready for school and waking up really doesn't sound super appetizing to her. But then at the end of the day, she's dealing with all the extra shit that goes along with being a mom. So just make sure you're carving out at least 30 minutes for her to like go do a Peloton ride. In totally. your garage. Yeah. And I think the 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 last piece is when you're getting into health and getting into like, hey, let, let's get back on the horse. It doesn't take an hour and a half, a 90-minute gym routine seven days a week. No. it's it. You can baby step into it with 25 minutes, 20 minutes, and you, you hit some cardio. Like yeah. it, it doesn't – At the I, end of the day, he absolutely has – you know, reason to approach her if like he's worried about her health. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, this all comes down to people being Mm self-motivating. No one is going to change any part of themselves if it doesn't come with from within. So it it has to come from, (laughs) there it is. It has to come from her. So especially if she's giving you the opportunity to talk about it, being like, I'm really unhappy. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm overweight. The doctor said I was overweight, blah, blah, blah. That's your end to encourage her. But you, him bringing it up constantly isn't going to do anything until she is the one to say, okay, I I, want to do this for me. We did mention diet. Yeah. Just healthy uh, eating. uh, Healthy eating. That's about 80% of it. Abs are made in the kitchen. Well, I'll tell you where they can help, who can help you with that. Yeah. Our friends over at Green Chef, Sally. Green Chef is one of my favorite sponsors we ever talk about in the Mail-In Podcast because they have taught me how to cook, honestly. Like, I am a better human, healthier human, better partner, better person because I have some kitchen etiquette now. I know what I'm doing. With ingredients and knives and this and that. And Green Chef is who to thank for that. They are the number one meal kit for eating well. With dinners that work for you, not the other way around. They have options for every lifestyle. Keto, protein-packed, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, and gluten-free. Um, and, and it's just super easy. Come right to your door. They put all the ingredients. There's no... There's there, I live by myself. I have a problem with wasting food because I'll go to the supermarket to buy stuff for a meal. Yeah. And then I have half, if not more than half of the thing I've used for that meal left over. Right. That I then have to incorporate into something else that maybe I don't want to. Maybe I'm I'm doing Mediterranean, then Asian, then uh, fish and chips. Like I don't, I just, sometimes it just doesn't work out with my schedule. Yeah. And then food goes bad. Not with Green Chef. You're a fan, right? I am a fan. We got some last week. Yeah. The uh, pesto kale flatbreads. Oh, are you kidding me? Uh, we so went good. through those quickly. And it was great because Will obviously is not eating as much meat anymore. Mm-hmm. So having like vegetarian options or options where I can leave the meat out or add it like this one, it was like they give you the recipe. Then it's like add protein. And I added chicken to mine. He left it off. It was great. Love that. 
Love that. I'm rocking with the uh, the sesame ginger shrimp bowl I'd made last last week. Yeah. Are you kidding me? So good. So good. Um, 50 plus weekly menu and market items with the option to mix and match meals from different dietary preferences in the same box without changing your plan. You can do breakfast, brunch kits, wholesome lunches, and more. You can easily add onto your weekly order. It's just easy. It makes eating healthy easy and cheaper than going to the grocery store, buying a bunch of food and wasting money. That's all. So here's the deal. Go to greenchef.com slash mail 60 and use code mail 60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. Again, go to greenchef.com slash mail 60 and use code mail 60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. Next one, Sal? Yes. I will read it. What's up? Want to keep this anonymous. I just accepted a big promotion at work. Lots of enthusiasm about me in the new role from peers and my boss. Seems like a perfect situation. Now that I'm in the new job, it's not as great as I expected. Lots of stress, long hours, and frustration. For a while, I chalked it up to a learning curve, but starting to think this was a mistake. How much of this is just getting used to more responsibility versus it's a bad fit? Is there a path to get out of this while staying at the company? This is interesting, right? It's like, okay, big promotion, more responsibility. I would assume a bump in pay. Yeah. And then you find out maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be. Yeah. Had this happened to me before. I think that this tends to be a problem with people who take on managerial roles Mm -hmm. because you kind of find yourself now being the boss of your old peers. Totally. And that, especially if those people were your friends, Mm -hmm. it like puts you in a weird position of like you're in a position of authority over them. Yeah. And that changes the dynamic at work and changes your friendships and things like that, which can like lead to a little bit of depression in the sense of like, do I have friends at work anymore? Yeah. Or do I just have or like what's my place over here? Right. Yeah. You know? Um, I'm wondering if that is playing into it at all. Sure. And and there's like a you know, you go from like day to day operations to manager to strategic, right? But in between strategic and day to day is sort of this limbo, this delegatory limbo where you're like do I, what, how much can I do? How much input? Yeah. And you're basically just telling people that's good or bad. Yeah. To boil it down. Maybe that's that, but maybe it's just, I don't like reporting to this. It's a lot of hours. It's a lot of frustrating. Like I, I can't do things that I used to be able to do within the company. And once you let that sort of doubt creep in, it's hard to to scrub it away. Like, oh man, did I did I fuck this up? Did I make this mistake? Yeah. The answer is like, if you did, it's not the end of the world because right. there's multiple ways to get out of it. There is, you know, grinding through it in quotes, getting to a your a place where your head's above water and you're you're not treading water anymore, and that just takes time. Yeah. And learning how to best suit this new role to your needs. Two, you can leave. I mean, I mean. It, it doesn't shut the door on a return to this company down the line if you really like them or you really like your peers or you really like your situation or city, you, you name it. Um, and you can bounce back and play the latter game. Three, it's, hey, I need to change my role in this yeah. company. And that's, depending on the size of your company, it's it's not the end of the world, I don't think. If you, if you put in enough time, maybe six months or eight months or whatever, and say, hey, I don't think this is the right role for me. I would maybe don't want to go back to where you were, but maybe you can find something more lateral right. to, to find something that suits where you're trying to be. So I don't think any of the options are easy, but it sounds like you need to you need to choose. And then once you make that decision, stick to it and and not look back. Because it's that's you you kind of you're in this situation, whether you like it or not, and and you have to you find a way through it. And you have ways out it's not the end of the world yeah for me there's a couple things one i would say how much time has it been so like you really need to give in my opinion at least six months to a year of like understanding how your work life balance has changed Mm -hmm. what your responsibilities are what the like nuances of your new job are things like that but then i also feel like so make sure you're giving enough time If, if it's like one month in, you're like, I hate this. Like, yeah. you have to give yourself time to be comfortable in the 
uncomfortableness, yeah. especially in the newness of change of like, you have to give yourself time to like adjust to all of that and how the change is affecting all the aspects of your life, whether it's like you're at the office more, so it's thrown off your workout routine or maybe your partner sees you less. So then that that's causing some friction at home and things like that. You have to like give yourself time to work through all of those little things that the new role is affecting. The other thing I would say is like, I agree with all of your points about changing your role. I think if, if possible, if there's somebody at the company who is like a mentor to you, your old boss, an old team member, somebody that you can talk to and kind of be like, I'm really unhappy. And it's because of these things. Maybe there's especially somebody at the company who understands what's going on, mm -hmm. who can like speak to that better, can be like, okay, you're, you don't like doing these tasks or like, this is causing you like a lot of stress. Let's find a way to work through that and like change either the, the process of doing it mm -hmm. or just put that, delegate that to someone else completely. Um, obviously it's hard for two people who don't know the exact work situation yeah, yeah. to like give advice to that. But somebody who works at the company does get all of those intricacies that are going on within the company right. that can tell you like, I think this is a good move. Or if you have a mentor that's like, Hey, you need to stick it out for one year and then you will literally have your pick of whatever you want to do. Sure. So having some expertise, some wisdom that can come from somebody else that has done it or that knows what you're going through is always helpful for them to give you kind of an outside perspective because outside slash inside. Cause when you're going through it, all you are seeing are the negatives, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And you're not thinking about like all the opportunity you're creating for yourself or, you know, like how the this sweat might equity, suck. If you exactly. Will. So you need someone who's not like, you can go talk to your partner every mm -hmm. day about it. But if they don't work with you, they don't really know what's going on. It's the same thing like when Will and I are talking about work and I'm talking about stuff at the hospital, like he can listen to me bitch and that there is a um, – there is a component of that that's really helpful. Yeah, I'm Just getting it out. Yeah. But at the same time, he can't offer any solutions. Yes. And it, when, when he does and like when we try to offer each other solutions that are work-based – it fails because we don't, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I come and record a podcast here, but I don't know like what is going on in the inner workings of this company. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't know what's going on in Neither the hierarchy of the, of the hospital. So it doesn't make sense for us to be like, well, you should go tell this person this, like, right. that's not going to work. You know, your partner, your friends or your parents or whatever are there to like, listen, instill confidence, but they're not there to like help you work through Mm -hmm. actual problems somebody that you work with can't so you think back of like who's been there maybe it's like a team member that you had that's been there for 30 years or your boss or whatever find them and get their opinion too yeah and and totally agree with that and also we you kind of you kind of touched on it and i wanted to jump in but you were on a roll when you if you're gonna you know stick it out if that's the option right you you find a way to Alter is not the right word, but you're trying to find a way to massage the role you're currently in. And whether that's going to your superiors for more resources right. or advice on delegation, like you mentioned. Like if there's if this is a workload problem, that can be fixed by delegating, that can right. be fixed by more people, that can be fixed by change in processes. Like that is a that 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 is a fixable thing, that will in turn help the hours, which will in turn help the stress. I'm sure and yeah. frustration. So maybe this is just resource management. In your new role, you were used to something else. Maybe you have kind of the power that you don't really didn't really realize. Right. To say, hey, we I need to hire somebody. Um, I need my team needs to be bigger. My team needs this. My team needs more time. My team needs a. Uh, sort of a schedule change or whatever but resource management is important here i think that's probably your your first step uh and then the other two more extreme options are are also there if you need them yeah uh next one here we go what's up guys hoping this will land on the female in 
episode. Well, it hasn't, but... It hasn't, but we're still going to answer your question. I think question. we can help out. My girlfriend and I have been together for about three years, but lately some new trends have started and I'm not sure how to deal with it properly. She's always been very into skincare and making sure her appearance is on point. However, lately, it seems this obsession has gone from a thorough skincare routine with top quality products to the constant, I need Botox here. I need lip filler here. I need this cool sculpted, this laser treatment, this electrotherapy to remove fat. I understand it's not my right to tell her what she can do with her body, and we all have insecurities when it comes to our bodies, but I can't help but feel like it's getting out of control. Most of what she's having done makes no difference in her appearance other than her lip stuff looking bad, but that's an entirely different discussion. How do I start to talk to her about this? How do I help her with the insecurities driving this? She's spending thousands and thousands of dollars for little result when she didn't need anything done in the first place. I blame TikTok. <laughs> yeah. I mean, social media is to blame for a lot of this. Yes. Um, because I think TikTok, Instagram, when you're following influencers, and especially now that people are being more upfront about the work they're getting done, mm -hmm. uh, it's really easy to be like, okay, I like, I see that I want that. I'm going to go get it in the same vein of like, I see those clothes. I want that. I'm going to buy it. Sure. We're starting to do that with our bodies, our bodies. Um, scary. Okay. A couple things to unpack here. I, I think, um, at a certain point, like you can only express like, Hey, I, I don't think you need that. I think you're beautiful without, I, I don't like I'm I'm worried that you're going to like go past yeah. a certain level and turn into like something that looks really fake. I and I think as a guy you're almost scared to say that because it either lands on deaf ears like she's numb to that. She's like, yeah. "Oh, you you have to say that." But you're like, "No, I I really believe that." Yeah. And then she goes over the top with something and then it's like that looks bad and I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. Uh I I think that that's I I as a person, I th like I would if Will wanted to tell me that I think that that's valid. Like mm -hmm. he's my partner, sure, my husband. I think there's also probably a place for like my sisters to tell me that. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, my sisters have told me that before. We have told each other that. Like your your love filler looks bad. <laughs> to be fair, I think I've talked about this on the podcast before. Lip filler, like the first two days afterwards, does not look great. On most people. Yeah. There's there's a cool down period there. Yeah. But like I have been with a sister to not be named who was like, I think I want to get more love filler. And we were like, no, 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 no. They already look full. You'll look like a duck. Mm -hmm. I hate that look. Yeah. So I like you do – it It does require somebody to say you you don't need that. You're going too far. This feel this feels the question specifically feels like a spiral. Yeah. But she is And it's really everything. easy to get caught up in that because I think we've talked about this before too. It's the same thing of like once you do your lips or once you put filler in your cheeks or once you have eyelash extensions, you become um that becomes what you're no, like you gain tolerance to that you become numb to what that looks like on your face it's sort of like a, you see it every day in the mirror so yeah. you're like i need more this like was a drug like almost this was my exact downward spiral with eyelash extensions <laughs> once you're used to the, the that that the becomes length. your normal right so like i had eyelash extensions when will and i first met that was 2015 for the next two years or really like mm -hmm. probably 2014 to 2016 the first time I got them, it was just like a little couple things. looked like I was wearing like a light coat of mascara. And then you get used to that and you're like, I want them fuller. So then they start putting in more. And then you're like, I need them longer. And then you look back and you're like, I had like insane fucking eyelashes that there's no way somebody thought were real. But you just get used to that. Mm -hmm. And then normal. you develop a glue allergy and then you have to stop because your eyes start swelling shut. Oh, like God. I did. So that's the other, you know, there is a chance that she does so many of these that like has a bad reaction to one of them. And then that's the, the catalyst. Ugh, it's just, it's, it's really important. 
in my opinion, when you're doing stuff like this, and I'm talking Botox and filler, I haven't like gone over the top with any other kind of aesthetics things. But in my opinion, and this is for the girls or the guys out there who haven't really done it yet, it's important to find a practitioner who is conservative. Because you want, I think, especially if you've never done it before and you're kind of scared, like I tell Just, friends this all the time. Not politically necessarily, but uh, a, like we're going to do a little bit first. See what you yeah, think. Yeah, I think like I've had friends be like, I'm like scared to get Botox. I'm like, if you go tell them like, hey, I want Botox, but I want to be able to move my eyebrows. Mm -hmm. Like most people are like, cool, we're going to start with this much. We're going to wait two weeks. We're going to come back. We're going to see what your level of comfort is. Mm -hmm. Most responsible Nurses and doctors who do who inject Botox, filler, et cetera, are going to say that to you because that is what is the correct thing to do. It's the safe thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. You can always give more. You can't take it back. Right. That's just a side caveat not speaking to this question. But it is. it may be this guy's responsibility, especially depending on how long they've been together. Did he say that in the question? A few Three years. years. Three years. Of like, hey – I'm worried that you're starting to turn into this and find like one of those influencers. I can think I know, of a couple the, the of them. super fake vibe. In my, like, I'm not going to call anybody out by name right now, but there's one girl I'm thinking of specifically that like has turned into like almost a caricature of herself with how much filler she I know, has. It's gross. And I, it's, I don't, gross I think, is the wrong word. But I'm like, sorry, I think but... people look at that and they're like, oh my God. Like, yeah. and no one told them. You know, I think it's because that once the, their circle just kind of becomes this insular bubble that they right. all do it. I'm thinking of like Love Island, for example. Yeah, like that that bubble when they get on the the outside world, they become these like just plastic figurines. Right. I think there is also a, a trend of, in the same vein of like doing all of these things of starting to go back towards natural beauty, and then you see people like starting to dissolve their filler and things like that. So the trend may change. Yeah. The thing that's scary is like when you start talking about like real blown, full blown plastic surgery implants, oh, BBLs, et cetera. Like a lot Randy of that did. you can't yeah. take back. I mean, you can take back, but that's yeah. thousands and thousands of dollars under anesthesia, oh. et cetera. So I think it's okay to say like, Hey, I don't think you need that. And not in the, like, she's like, Oh no, no, no. Like this is what makes me happy. Be like, no. What are you chasing? I don't want you to look like this. And then yeah. pull up a picture and be like, this does not look good to me. I'm not attracted to that. I'm attracted That's, to you how you are. Is that where you can pull the attraction card? Yes. When it's like truly fake crap like that. Yeah. All for having a skincare routine. I love skincare. I, I'm about moisturizing and all that stuff. When you cross the line into changing your appearance with fake stuff, like like bad Fake stuff. I'm yeah. all a little bit of Botox here. Totally get it. A little bit of filler here. Totally get it. When you're going like the electro and the red lights and the and the cools, like I don't get it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, there's actually like a really a lot of good research. That red light <laughs> therapy is really good for you. But anyway, what what I'm saying is, I think you can be honest with her. Like, I don't think that this is yeah. like removing your buckle fat's not necessary. Like you're that's that is a procedure that like you can't put it back, mm -hmm. and that this is like super trendy right now. So like, is that like lipo? It's the move, removing the fat pad. Oh, yeah. I don't know. So you buckle fat's the fat that like exists in your cheek. Mm. And people are removing it so that their cheek. Me and Randy are both being like jawline, well, like fat? that their cheeks pop more. I got you. Some would say Tom Brady's done it probably. Mm. Or he just eats vegan. We don't know for sure. Uh, the The issue with that is that it, you can't bring it back. And there's actually a lot of research right now. That, like when you get um, it's too much fat removed from your face or say you are on a on Ozempic and you lose too much fat in your face, it makes you look older because people who are mm. younger and more youthful tend to have rounder faces. So when your face starts drooping because you have no like fat to keep it plumped up. Oh, it'll just really, oh. It ages you more. Yeah. So I think that is worth saying. I think it's worth saying like, I wouldn't say I'm not attracted to you. I would say I'm attracted to you how you are. I'm not attracted to this. Mm -hmm. I'm worried that you're starting to spiral. I think all of those things are 
good answers. Here's the thing. Again, she is going to do what she ultimately wants to do. You have the opportunity to tell her what you feel and try to protect her. But like, she's an adult woman. She can make her own decisions. And if this turns into a full blown lifestyle spiral, like to me, that's like another, Mm -hmm. like, do we need to question our relationship status? And I think one of the things I would do here is in like a sit down situation, I would ask where, where is this, like, where's the motivation coming from? And if she (laughs) wants to get into insecurities, great. Where is the incentive yeah. here? Like, what is what is, is this going to make you feel happier? Let's like let's get into the below the Especially surface. Especially if you're like spending so much money that you're going right on it. Let's get below the surface here before we talk about what's on the surface. Yeah. How about that? Wow, wow. You know what we could just do? Maybe hop in with some athletic greens every day. Glowing from within. AG one, glowing from within and out. Your skin looks fantastic, Sally. Thank you. Athletic greens. Some people have told me I'm glowing. There you go. Athletic Greens is uh, 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food, whole food. I trip up on this every time. Whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day right in one scoop. One scoop into the container, looks nice and green, plop it in your water, mix it up, down the hatch. You are on your way to a better regimen. Simple as that. Simple as that. It supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. All of the things I'm not saying is the only thing to do for any of those, but it is a little step you can take to help all of them. Capish, I'm a morning guy. Me too. On the way to work or yep. just before work, scoop down, mix it up, down the hatch, good to go, a little pineapple, a little tropical bubble gum kind of sensation to me. Check it off your morning routine. Check it off. Like you're making your bed. The morning routine. Exactly. It's lifestyle friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, or artificial anything, while still tasting good, supports better sleep quality as well, and recovery. Mental clarity, alertness, it is just something you can do every single day to help yourself out. Plus, it costs you less than $3 a day. So you're investing in your health. Here's the thing. Cheaper than a cold brew habit. Natural, 7,000 five-star reviews, rec- recommended by professional athletes like me and Sally. You name it. It's just yeah. a good routine thing you can do to get your day going and feel better. And right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Like we said, one scoop and a cup of water every single day. You're good to go. No need for a million, pill- uh, million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D plus five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash mail-in. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash mail-in to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Next one, Sal. Hey, Brett and Sally, how much is too much to ask my friends to pay for my bachelor party? I'm having my bachelor party this May in Kentucky to do a little bourbon trail experience. The problem is the majority of my friends are currently in single income households with their wives as they are all going through career changes right now and are back in school. The cost per attendee is looking like it will be somewhere in the $500 to $600 range for lodging, transport, tours, and tasting. My internal justification, I attended all of their bachelor parties' weddings, which were all out of state for me. My fiance and I aren't having a traditional bridal party, so all of my friends attending will see the cost savings of not having to buy a rent suit, which I had to do for theirs. If I'm doing, if I spend $500 on a bachelor party, that is a huge win for me. That's a steal. That is a, that is a, not, I need not a drop in the bucket, but friends. like, yeah. My dumbass friends. Oh yeah. I, like I, I think I spent like the, the equivalent of like one year's salary on probably all of my friends' bachelor <laughs> Bouncer up, please. Absolutely. Which I, is I, honestly I, absurd. I probably should have put, put my put my foot down a couple times. There's four digits in my head every time I, I look at a bachelor party. Yeah. Uh, minimum. Minimum. And I think so. I I don't know, five to six hundred bucks for everything. Like that's a flight. Yeah. You're you're golden there. 
what I would say about this, and I, I don't uh, – what Brett and I just said, I don't want to normalize spending Very in the true. thousands Sorry. on a bachelor agree, bachelor agree, party. Agree. That's shouldn't be normal. <laughs> uh, yes. I – and if you're planning on going to Cabo and your friends are brought, end up spending that much, they're all adults. They can say yes or no. Right. They can make a decision on it. Uh, I – I don't think that this is that much to ask, given get exactly what he said. Like, but I also don't think you have to come at it with like a, "Hey, we're here's what we're doing for the bachelor party." I'm thinking it's going to cost this much, but you don't need to rent a suit for the wedding. So, like, it's a wash. People yeah. can put that together in their own heads. Don't don't justify decisions for them by saying yeah. something else. Just say, "Here's the deal. Here's what it is. If you make it awesome, if not, no worries. I don't. I wouldn't even play like the. You. I went to yours." card right. you know i went to your wedding because situations change people have kids people and, and, yeah people it's... will decide for themselves whether or not they can fiscally swing it mm-hmm. and like he said and like you just said maybe some of these people are in a position where they cannot afford sure. 500 dollars right now mm-hmm. and that's okay and sometimes you're in a position where you can blow money and go to cabo for four days and sometimes you have to say no to other things correct and yep i think Stre- this is the age old. I- I'm stressed. I want my friends to have a good time. Ugh. Blah blah. But it's a bachelor party. It's a- <laughs> we say this every every freaking week. It's your bachelor party. Do what you want. Your friends will come or they won't. It it, it shouldn't affect like your friendships with people. Some mm-hmm. people. And then on the flip side, if you're going to someone's bachelor party, bachelorette party, and there's extenuating circumstances like. You can't afford it or it's your graduation or it's, you know, you're pr- newly pregnant or whatever it may be. Sure. You are an adult human. You can make those decisions and you yes. don't owe anybody anything. Correct. For choosing to go or not. And the same thing of like, yes, you attended all of these people. You're a good friend. You're supporting them. But you, when you're the bride or the groom, it's about you. Please recognize that, like, you're not doing anybody any favors. You're not planning a trip for them that they would normally take themselves. They're going on a trip to celebrate you. That is perfectly fine. You should absolutely enjoy that. But you also need to be aware that when people cannot attend for any reason they choose, like, you have to, they're an adult, you have to understand that. Absolutely. Even if it's a dumb reason. But like, I don't, I don't think, I think this is perfectly fine. If the, if like answering the question, that's a perfectly fine amount of money. I think in 2023, hopefully most of these people can swing that. It's, you know, that's still a lot of money, but given the fact that you, you know, spent time and money attending theirs, but I don't think you owe them any explanation when you email saying, Mm -hmm. here's the itinerary, here's how much it's going to cost. Wanted to let you guys know, like, since you're not really having to go out of state or like be part of a, uh, you know, the bridal party or whatever, you don't owe anybody any explanations. Totally. Totally. Just say, here's what we're doing. Please let me know if you're coming. Would love for you to be there. And it's really cool. Just the little bourbon trail experience. Love that idea. But I think people get really in their heads of course they do. It's it's because that's the world we've built. Right. For uh, in ourselves. both in both roles, whether yes. you are the groom or you're the groomsman, mm-hmm. or you're the bride or you're the bridesmaid, people inherently only think of themselves. Of course. And so of when you're thinking, when you're a bridesmaid and you're stressed because you're like, <sighs> my girlfriend's gonna hate me because I can't go because Like I, you know, my sister is like literally having her first ever baby that week. And like, I just feel like I can't miss the birth and blah, blah. Like, Mm -hmm. guess what? You're an adult and you make that decision and likely it's going to affect your friend for like 30 seconds when you tell her and then people are going to move the fuck on. It's, we have a, a question that's going to be in next week's episode that is like wedding planning is consuming this poor bride. Yeah. Because in the guy's like every decision she's thinking of everybody else but herself. Yeah. And I'm just like, I we're gonna have the same answer. It's it's you. It's your thing. It's not selfish to be your thing. It's and you can't, it's, it's you your, can't you know, base every decision you make as an adult on everyone else. If you want to go to Thailand for your bachelor party and it's gonna cost nine grand for everybody, 
and you want to do it and you can swing it, go ahead. Just know that the attendance might be low. There might be one dude who does it with you. But like, if you want to do that, do it. You just have to know, like, set yourself up expectations wise and just like. That's so much of adulthood. Yeah. Is growing up and realizing like I'm responsible for my own feelings and no one else's. Mm -hmm. And I can't make sure everyone's having a good time. I can't make sure that all my friends are happy with me. I can't make sure everyone's comfortable. I can control my own emotions and reactions. And that is all. Exactly. That applies to every situation in your life. And the older you get, the more you recognize that. Are we good at it? Not all the time, but like the Do more we you slip, re- sure. But like you, your paradigm totally shifts from like in your twenties to like being a people pleaser, but also being selfish to being like when you're older, being like, okay, I value my time and effort and sanity, and this isn't serving me anymore, or is not going to serve me, so I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. Mic drop. Sally Just a DeFreeze. little life lesson. Mic drop. This. <laughs> well done. Uh, hey, Brett and Sally. Uh, bear with me here as I need your help transitioning to the post-grad workforce. I have one class this semester to finish my undergrad degree, and generally speaking, I'm looking at entry-level sales or recruiting roles. I'm 26 and have worked part-time now for 10 years in jobs that include grocery stores, landscaping, pizza delivery, hotel valet, golf courses, masonry, and even a deployment with my Army Reserve Unit. Despite all this, I still struggle with the anxiety of starting a role in an office. Even though I'm confident in my people skills, work ethic, and ability to learn on the job, etc., I've already signed up for a uh, an Excel certification course at a local community college and budgeted for a business casual shopping spree. But... What else can I do to feel confident and prepared for the corporate world? Thanks and love y'all. Look at this guy. You are the most prepared person I've ever seen. Most people go in with way less preparation. My God. You are are going to – let us be the ones to to instill some confidence here. You are more than ready. Yeah. Only psychopaths go into a new job and are fully confident. Yeah. Like I've never met that person. Zero. I'm assuming – it's a literal psychopath, like where you just have no empathy or like. Shouts to Abby. It's it's consulting, <laughs> the first first year out of college consulting uh, associates. Okay, analysts. but like, but you know what I'm saying? Like, even our friends. I I will never forget this. This is like probably such a dumb story, but we uh, when I went to UT, a bunch of my friends did the MPA program where you are you do a master's in accounting on top of your like yeah, yeah, regular yeah. bachelor. Mm-hmm. So you stay for a fifth year and they Shots. all, I think it was our fourth year of college. They all go do an internship mm-hmm. for tax season. Usually with one of the big four firms. So nice. a bunch of, bunch of my friends, a bunch of my guy friends are going to go work for E and Y in Houston. And they're all talking about it. Like we were all like out after they'd, they'd been in Houston, <laughs> like their first day. Oh God. And one of my guy friends is like, Thought, like I was so they're all talking about how nervous they were the first day and they're like ha- literally the first day is like a meeting you mm-hmm. know they're like yeah, yeah, yeah. an like orientation onboarding <laughs> my friend's like I have I went to Costco and bought a giant pallet of five hour energy and I'm just gonna drink one five hour energy every morning because I just don't want to get addicted to coffee I'm so nervous about that like it was just what? like the sweetest like most pure <laughs> <laughs> like Every single person goes through new job anxiety. Yeah, even absolutely. if you are like the big swinging dick and you're like got hired on to like be the consultant, like no person goes in with change and is fully comfortable because you don't know you're jumping into the abyss. If right, you, you kind of know you have the responsibilities that's, that are listed in the job description. Right, but like. I was fucking terrified to come here. Yeah. Because all it, of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm, I talked a big game, but like, uh, can I can I deliver? Like, and even here we being are a resident four years later. But. And I'm like fully managing my own cases, et cetera. Like, the first day you're there, you're still like, oh shit. Like, it doesn't matter being in a new environment, being with new people, being in a new job, new process, new whatever freaks people out. This guy's, you're very prepared. Yeah. Know that it's okay. The anxiety is – that's a good thing. That means that like you are – your body is responding appropriately 
to like a new situation. That is mm-hmm. that is called the stress response. Like everyone needs to have an intact stress response. So when you walk into the office for the first time and you maybe fumble and you like mess up someone's name or you sit in the wrong chair or you do whatever, everyone's done it. Everyone and no one again, back to the other question. Everyone's thinking about themselves, so no one gives a shit about what you just did. So if you mess up on the first day, assuming you didn't, like, lose the company thousands of dollars or something, like, and you, you uh, you know, called Mary Susan, mm-hmm. no one's going to remember that. Totally. Like, you no, know, every, everyone does something on their first day or first week that they think is, like, the biggest deal in the world, and no one cares. Now, I will say... Your first three weeks, buckle down. That's that's when FaceTime is important because there's some study out there that's like th- your first three weeks on the job set this like the tone or impression of you right. that, that is very difficult to change, even if it's not even comparable to what you're – but post three weeks, is. having a little bit of anxiety is good for that. Oh, it I makes totally you agree. Yeah, yeah. Work hard it makes you like. Be efficient and diligent and all of those things. Mm -hmm. And clearly this person cares enough. Like he is like very ready to be in the workforce and he cares about like being successful. If you don't care, if you don't have anxiety, you lose the like lack of hustle essentially. Totally, yeah. And then you run the risk of being the person who's way too laid back and everyone's like, what is his problem? Mm -hmm. Like why is he rolling in like he owns the place? Correct. The best thing for your anxiety here will be to start the job. Right. It it is the same thing as the anxiety of going to a doctor's appointment, a trip, a, a dance in high school, like anything, a meeting, yeah. a performance review. All that anxiety leading up to it is for a reason because you're trying to prepare for all scenarios, right? Yeah. Your body, that's your body triggered itself to overthink, and then you get into it, yeah, and it's like playing a game, right? You you. Get nervous about this game. You 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 know what's at stake, and then when you play it, it's just you're back in, like like there's you're back into it. Yeah, that's what's going to happen with your job, and you'll be fine. Yes. You'll be more than fine, honestly, given your resume. Yeah, and your work ethic and your preparedness. So good for you. All right. Hi, Mail and Crew. This is a work-related question. A little backstory. I bought a successful small-town business with one of my relatives a couple years ago and have been running it ever since. I absolutely love my job. Nine out of 10, our customers are awesome and I enjoy what I do. However, I've noticed the past year that I can never fully relax when I get home from work. I know this comes with the territory territory of owning your own business, but I'm constantly anxious about stuff that happened at work that day and I'm worried about customers' perceptions of me. I deal heavily with the public. I realize that this small kind of stuff shouldn't matter, but it's gotten so bad lately that my daily anxiety makes me feel physically sick and just takes over my mind to where I can't enjoy time at home with my loved ones. I know y'all aren't doctors, but what are some things to help you unwind after busy work days or even after stressful days? I never check my work email after getting home and don't answer any Facebook or text messages pertaining to work if I'm not at the store. I'm also on anxiety meds. These things help a ton, but would love any ideas y'all have as far as to turn off my work brain off for the night. Okay. Work brain. We're going to be quick about this. Yes. Because we've gone a little over time, but here's a couple things. Number one, if you are already on anxiety meds and you're stressing out this much that you're becoming physically ill, you need to go to therapy. Number one. Number one. Mostly because somebody who is a therapist is going to give you coping skills and different exercises to deal with Mm -hmm. the anxiety that you're currently experiencing, especially if you are not able to like unplug and it's affecting your daily life. My number one answer pretty much always is seek professional help. (laughs) We can boil down the Malin podcast to do things because you want to. Right. Right. Communicate with your partner and or anybody in your life. Go to therapy. Yeah. Mostly because the therapist is going to – for me, dealing with anxiety is like a two-prong approach. Medicine is helpful. Mm -hmm. But You also need the the talking portion. You need the therapy portion of like learning how to deal with stress, anxiety, and then finding coping mechanisms like finding exercises, things like that. Flip side. 
here are some things that you can do before you get into therapy or while you're trying to find a therapist in the meantime to help. A lot of people are going to say exercise. Mm -hmm. Physically working out anxiety is helpful. True. Especially if you're if you're experiencing physical manifestations like increased heart rate, feeling sick, et cetera, going and probably doing cardio is like your best bet, but something that can like burn off some of that extra anxious energy. Yes, absolutely. Um, meditation is very helpful. I think especially for anxious people, that's really hard to get into, but the more meditation is an exercise, mm -hmm. your mind is a muscle. You have to exercise it. So Doing meditation one time is not going to work. You're going to be like, this was stupid and I hate it. You have to do it consistently to see results. And I would, especially if you've never meditated before, start, get an app like Calm or honestly Peloton has great ones. Uh, what if you already are a member of something, but mm -hmm. start at like five minutes and work your way up sure. because you, again, you, you, um, become resilient. You learn how to start meditating. It takes time to like work up to a 30 minute meditation. Yeah. I would say the same for yoga. Like when you, especially the, those, that's the mixing of like the exercise and meditation portion of like, you need to, something to take your mind off of whatever, you know, the work that's stressing you out. I will go with my, um, <laughs> answers here what am i doing to unwind and and i've had work anxiety i've had relationship anxiety i've had parental anxiety health anxiety yeah all the anxieties i've i've probably had a little bit here and there my unwind uh i've found is a huge help is yoga yeah uh specifically the hot version um because one it requires you to leave your phone and your locker so it's not fucking on you yeah 100 percent of the time and it's a good workout, et cetera, you know, all the things. It, it, it's sort of meditation combined with a workout. I love it. Right. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Two, I exercise. Now, it might not just be gym, yoga, what? It, it, it's hockey. It's yeah. softball. It's playing a sport. It's doing something physically active that's not necessarily like just me solo. It's especially a team situation. Right. Because I crave that competitive juice that I had in high school and college and got to get it out on the field and haven't had that in a while. So now that feels good to have that again. That gets my mind off things and has done a great job with that. Um, and three, I turn my brain on to something else. Yeah. Which is like, I don't think I've ever mentioned this on this podcast. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to you. I love to write. Yeah. Uh, specifically like screenwrite. Uh -huh. So I've written like seasons of television. Yeah. In my spare time. Just That's because awesome. it's like a turn my brain, like totally – it's totally a hobby. get into yeah it's a hobby right it's it's exactly it's something that i'm interested in among other things like maps and uh like i read tax maps all day because i like to see who owns what parcels and which land it's kind of weird but anyway it's just something to turn your brain on to something else right and turn your brain off of whatever thing is getting at you that day. yeah normally uh, again it, this is different for every person I realized in 2022 that reading smut novels helped me like not think about the existential crisis of our world. Mm -hmm. So you, everyone has something different. You just kind of have to test out what works for you. Again, this is not like a one time you do it. You're like, I hated that. Some of these things take time to actually appreciate. Yeah. So give yourself the opportunity. But finding a hobby is difficult, especially at our age where you're like – Totally, yeah. Okay, I don't like want to put all these like resources into painting and things like that. But like Will and I were just talking about this the other day. Like Will's gotten this record player and like started collecting stuff and been listening to the albums at our house and all these things. And it's like totally given him like a outlet of – just stress relief and creativity and things like that where he could just like unwind and yeah. something to do and think about that's not work work family so, friend like just it's your it's you time it might be baking it might be you know gardening it might be walking it might be playing bunko like yeah. who knows what it is but finding a hobby is so important for all of us i'm really bad about this it's really easy to get into the like okay, I'm going to turn my brain off by scrolling Instagram and, look, sure, and watching yeah. TV. And normally that does more harm. I mean, th that's always helpful at some times. Sometimes we just need to turn our brain off and watch mm -hmm. six episodes of The Office. But 
at the same time, it's really easy to let your mind wander during those times. And that's when the anxiety creeps in. When you're focused on something like screenwriting, you don't have the opportunity to sit there and worry about what happened with the customer that day because totally, you're yeah. very in what you're, you're doing. Consumed by that vein that you've tapped. So think about what your interests are, tap into that, get a hobby. Um Totally agree. One, and, and the last thing I'll mention, which I have mentioned on this podcast before, and you have to be careful with, obviously, uh, I do like going to a bar, opening my laptop and having one glass of wine and doing something, whether it's screenwriting, whether it's kind of reconstructing my finances, whether it's answering an email that I need to answer. Like, yeah. th- it is something that I, I'm not saying turn to a bar and or alcohol to unwind, but it does help me in moderation. I think in moderation, especially if you've had like a particularly stressful day or you need like a change of scenery. That's more what it is. I, yeah. I, I could go there and have a club soda and it, this, you would get the same effect. Right. It's not the alcohol that is uh, helping me. It's it the, is the like, change of – it's the environment. It's the environment. Yes. Yeah. Um, good episode this week, so I think we were clicking. I have zero shower thoughts. Zero shower thoughts. Did you get your license figured out? No, I didn't do my thing. So we won't talk. <laughs> We're going to do it today. <laughs> today is the day. Please subscribe, rate five stars, review, and tell a friend about the Mail-In Podcast. Hit the hotline number 888-362-MAIL. That is 888-362-6245. Or you can write in at the link to the Twitter bio at Mail-In Podcast. Sally, where can we find you? Sally DeFries on Instagram and Twitter. I am Brett Merriman at Schmerriman on both of those platforms. That's Randy Trimbacki on the ones and twos. Shouts to Adam clipping this thing, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Bye.